Yukiko Amagi, the reserved intelligent one, the future inheritor of the Amagi Inn, the low-key sadist, and the third addition to your party in Persona 4. According to Newsflash, Persona Central 2015, on an Atlas livestream, Yukiko was the ninth most popular character in Persona 4, making her the least popular of the investigation team, only edging out Teddy on Nico Nico, a popular Japanese video and streaming service in Japan. In the West, this opinion seems to have historically been similar for once as well. People find Yukiko boring, but regardless of any of that, I'm going to do my best analyzing Yukiko Amagi to the most in-depth extent that I can think possible and maybe have more people offer her some charity in return. Yukiko Amagi's initial impression is that of the cool beauty archetype, someone unobtainable and cold you quickly see by virtue of Chie and spending a moment alone with her prior to the kidnapping, that she's actually also following the cool beauty archetype, fairly easily embarrassed and immature secretly and deep down. Where people saw a cutting silence, there is an implied pressure of the inn that may have driven down confidence in her own perspective and desires instead. You get a sense that she is very stressed and has a lot on her own plate, making her pretty much unaware of the very popularity all around her. One thing brought up near whenever you first meet her is a thing called the Amagi Challenge, a challenge where a guy tries to ask Yukiko out, and without fail, always they fail. They get turned down. She never goes on a date. Everyone sees her as the jewel of Inaba, in a way. The pretty, hard-to-get, daughter of Inaba's most renowned tourist location, but it's clear that this description of her feels odd and off-putting. She works and does her schoolwork. In a way, her nature of keeping her head down and quietly excusing herself to her tasks does come off as boring. You wonder what else she has going on. The lack of something radically recognizable hopefully is enticing to some of the viewers who want to learn more. That more is delivered upon. It becomes pretty clear Yukiko is going to be kidnapped, but the investigation team still doesn't have total confidence that she is, or where, or how, or really anything, and what to do about which way to prevent it. They decide to watch the Midnight Channel, and the image is radically different from the reserved traditional girl shown days prior. Yukiko is the first party member to have a dungeon, and is also the first victim of the first proper dungeon in the game. The castle. As I talked about in my segment on how the Midnight Channel works, if you haven't seen that by the way, check that out for further context, dungeons of victims who appear on the Midnight Channel have dungeons and shadow selves created of the public subconscious, the shadow parts of the world psyche. Meaning the shadow claiming to be the true self is true, both being the classic perception of the own person's perception of themselves and the perception of all of those who look after them. A sick amalgamation of denied traits by the ego and personal insecurities hidden away with the desires of the judgment from the public. Yukiko's central conflict is revealed. While she remains obedient to the expectations of her upbringing and the authority figures surrounding her, she instead wants someone to be her liberator. Someone reliable, liable, intelligent, and stable. Someone to whisk her away from the rigidness of her upbringing. To whisk her away like a princess from the castle. As we see entering the dungeon with Yukiko's commentary, she wants people to seek her, to validate her, but only so they can compete for who's the strongest contender. Not someone worthy of her love, so to say, like stereotypes and tradition would bend your ear towards, but instead someone worthy in their capability to liberate and rescue. It is the act of becoming free itself that she seeks more than any man, but from her traditional upbringing she sees a man as the easiest way to obtain this freedom. The illusion of her Prince Charming isn't the prince, but the idea that if he can provide her that liberation, he can have anything he wants of her in exchange. Almost like a game or a business transaction, a survey with the technical precision of a true love encounter, artificially formulated for non-love related technical success. This is displayed by the over-the-top game showmanship of the tacky billboards, which is not replicated in dungeons like the rest. Some are more like interview shows, some plain Edo shows, most of which are in some way supposed to represent public broadcasting tabloids, conspiracy theory type content that make up most of the locally rented TV slot space through the cable of old. The visual imagery then of a princess in a castle is pretty straightforward for Yukiko, albeit with those slight adjustments given the context. 
her being the princess of the Amagi Inn, Inaba's most prestigious landmark, being seen as beautiful and unobtainable, and her discontentment with life at the inn, wanting someone to sweep her off her feet and take her somewhere that she can live worry-free. Her dress being a pink and white ball gown, as I talked about in my segment with the Soljima interviews in Color Theory, not only fits with her natural color scheme, but is also leaning more heavily into the ideas of passion, romance, and sexuality present in her shadow's portrayal. It should be noted that the flowers on her dress also serve double duty, with the obvious idea of the rose with thorns playing into it, as well as the generic word for flower, Hana, tying back into her later revealed persona and mythology. Another thing she mentions is that maybe her Prince Charming is playing hide-and-seek in the fog. The shadow intentionally belittles and mocks the ways that these aspects of themselves have been shunned away by their holder. So this is likely a jab at Yukiko being aware of the fact that this is a fruitless hope and idea. The fog, which unanimously stands in as a metaphor for lies in Persona 4 Golden, is something being mocked. Like, maybe you can find the man of your dreams if you keep wishing hard enough. If you hunt for him, eventually the perfect man will just show up. Regardless of her not being willing to reach out and meet the men who do, if she just keeps dreaming about being saved, eventually it'll happen, right? The Shadow is mocking that idea. It's making fun of her childishness that someone will, without prior motive or knowledge, perfectly fit her purpose and be willing to follow through with them, even without any separate feelings on any of the matters that she finds important. With Chie's awakening encounter, we learn that Yukiko, despite holding this childish little girl's wish that a handsome man will come in magically on a beautiful horse and save her from her cage, also doesn't feel like she possesses any traits worth saving. Her name, Yukiko Amagi, means two things. The Yuki is, of course, snow, as she's drawn attention to. The Ko is simply to mean a child, therefore a child of the snow. The way that she interprets herself is a fleeting, transient thing with no value, but snow instead is something beautiful and unobtainable, something that you can never keep under control. It shows her level of worthlessness as she quite effectively flips the metaphorical meaning behind the beauty of snow in order to back up her feeling of not having a purpose. Her last name, Amagi, is constructed from two characters that together mean castle and sky, a castle in the sky. Yukiko is already free in the clouds, equipped with her ability and height to soar far, but she feels like the princess of a guarded castle. Little does she recognize that as the princess, she is the castle's keeper, not the other way around. She feels insecure that she can't do anything on her own without relying on others, and so despite wanting to leave and wanting someone to save her, she just feels like she's just dead weight, offering nothing. And it's not like she knows where to go anyway if she were to be rescued. Her powerlessness from others makes her want to escape but her solution was just to have another person take care of everything for her. Her responsibility may change, but is she really escaping from her problem, even if her dream comes true? When we finally get to her boss room, the tiles on the floor all have flowers in them, the gold rug design being made of flower stems and vines. On either side of her pillars, which represent her arcana, but we'll get back into that in its proper segment, small gold cages hang from the ceilings, and bird wings attached to the heart print on the tapestry drape behind her. Next is the confirmation of what I already shared. She confirms that Chie was a prince. Someone to rely on, someone strong who made decisions. The utility of what a prince means to Yukiko is the ability to let her escape. This likely developed when she was young. When Chie and Yukiko met, Yukiko was sad as she had been told to get rid of a dog that she found, as we find out through Chie's social link later on. Chie found her sad and offered to take the dog in for herself. From then, Chie made effort to bring happy moments back to Yukiko's sore, sad life, and even allowed Yukiko to somewhat have the things that she liked, like wanting a dog by virtue of visiting Chie's house. Chie was Yukiko's taste of escape from being told no all the time as a child, being driven in proper manners, being made to work at the height of customer service, but somewhere along the way, Yukiko realized that while Chie could help her feel better about her problem, Chie didn't have the ability or strength to fix it. That's what her Prince Charming is. The heart, as depicted on the wall, isn't about love, but who can free her heart, giving it the ability to soar toward the things that she wants. Now Yukiko speaks up. She does love her mother and the workers at her inn, despite feeling pressure and guilt to sacrifice herself to them. But the most important thing is how the flower imagery changes with her kimono. 
Shadow Yukiko is this lustful rose with thorns, a lust for her freedom and a thorn for those who cannot provide. The flowers on Yukiko's kimono, though, are sakura blossoms, not roses, and her outfit lacks the aggressive red of the shadow. Once again, all this flower imagery becoming important in a moment with her persona. The chandelier descends, showing Yukiko as a bird in a cage once the boss fight starts, except no, she actually isn't. She perches on the edge of the cage, spreading her wings broadly. This is a twist on the normal visual metaphor showing that this trapped feeling Yukiko has is not because she's genuinely trapped, but because she mentally feels like she is. She has the power and ability to talk to her mother, to let them know how she feels, but she chooses not to, instead locking herself in. So in actuality, she could fly free at any time, but stays perched at the edge of the cage, hoping someone else will make the choice for her, as she's too scared to take the step despite the thing that she feels trapped of directly relating to feeling that no one lets her make those choices. Eventually she summons a prince, but note its design. It's decorated and dressed like a prince should be, sure, leading into the aesthetic, but the body underneath is robotic. There's nothing sexual or romantic about it. It goes back to the idea that finding love or finding someone for themselves isn't the goal. The goal is a utility, a prince who can do her bidding, protect, and free her from her confines. After the fight, she concedes this and accepts herself. She was looking at Chie as a way out. She did feel like she wanted someone to save her from her responsibility and from having to make her own decisions. Then the shadow transforms into Konohano Sakuya, who is depicted with Sakura blossoms as wings, the same as were on her kimono. The story of Konohana Sakuya Hime, the Hime meaning princess, is a goddess of volcanoes and the growth of the cherry blossoms, explaining the cherry blossom imagery and the vines used all throughout her dungeon. The volcanoes make sense with her fire type attacks. In a well-repeated story where Kaguya's husband accused her of infidelity once she became pregnant, Konohana Sakuya locked herself inside the building and set it on fire, claiming if the baby was theirs, the children would escape the building without harm. And so she and the children did, proving her innocence. I think it's good to keep account on the shallow end that this also connects with fire proving Sakuyahime's pure actions and lack of infidelity, which works well as Yukiko then uses those flames of Sakuya to continue facing her true self and seeking the truth of the case. But also the fact that she locked herself inside the building, not her husband or anyone else that tested her with this act. She did. This also comes back to the key, the lock, and the door, all being something Yukiko had control over. She sought freedom, but maybe to prove her strength and assure her love for those in her life. She kept herself under that strict obedience. Even when we hear nothing about her parents demanding her to study, and seemingly never even asking her to cook for the inn. Her dedication to her studies and eventual attempt at learning to cook is a pressure that she has placed upon herself to prove her willingness to be a positive force, her pure intentions to be worth something on her own. I have another segment talking about ultimate personas, so I will pass that information on for later there. If you haven't seen the video, by the way, I really hope you check it out and enjoy. I'll link it somewhere around here. Also, a like, comment, or share on this video is hugely appreciated if you're enjoying everything I'm talking about so far. We still have so much more to go, and these videos took forever. So seriously, please consider spreading this if you enjoy it. But before we move on to the social link, I want you to keep in mind what I said earlier about the fact that Shadow Yukiko stood between two dormant pillars, equal distance on the right and the left. Those pillars are a nice detail for later once again, so I'm asking you to remember it once we finish talking about her social link. Yukiko, after recovering from her event from the TV world, still remains uncomfortable and shy, opening up to the player after the events inside the TV. She's grateful to them, but she has trouble knowing how to act in order to not have the wrong impression. She seems very aware of how it looked uh, on the inside, but for some reason is still scrambling for if she can trust you or what to take of your inclusion in that situation. Since, to her, you're still basically a stranger. It's after a few more times spent together, such as getting her number while spying on Kanji, that she finally opens up a bit and thus lets you start her link. She's not the only character to do this, by the way, by a long shot. Nanako doesn't open up until after the vacation plans get canceled. Naoto doesn't open up until you have a logical reason to hang out with her. 
but Yukiko is the first to seemingly delay out of the things she has issue with, taking on her own initiative, which her social link will explore. The time spent in the Shadow World caused her to face the part of herself that fell for the lie of being rescued. Now that she has faced herself and is no longer waiting for someone to save her, she has to learn to take her own life into her own hands and become a more rounded and competent person. Which is where things immediately pick up in her link. Normally, if people remember Yukiko's link, it concerns with the cooking aspect of the later parts at the shrine, but the first social link actually starts with her buying a book on job offers and a declaration to herself and you. When she graduates, she's leaving this town. That she refuses to inherit the Amagi Inn. Now, for the first time, she will try and see what the outside world has, the way that things are like. She laughs proudly that she was able to even say something like that out loud, and perhaps this is the most important thing taken from the situation. Not what she said, but that she felt she was able to state how she felt aloud, and validate the feelings she had that she would have otherwise have pushed down and dismissed, leading to how we saw her prior. One thing she says that she wants is to be an interior decorator, something she feels she's grown familiar with working at the end, straightening up rooms, rearranging furniture, she probably knew she liked that sort of thing, and if she had total control over it, that would be liberating and fun for her. She insists on not telling her mother, though, but interestingly, doesn't actually say anything specific about her mother cracking down on her or putting blatant disapproval, which becomes a subtle theme of this link. This makes it so Yukiko's link sort of mirrors Shu's link, just like Yosuke mirrors Naoki's. Rank 2 consists of the introduction of the food portion of her arc. Her reasoning is that she needs to learn to make good food and shop for groceries because eating out is bad for you, and she's going to be living on her own after so long. She acknowledges that it's one of the skills she needs to learn to operate competently outside of the inn. Although it honestly is just a good skill to have in general, I, I love cooking. It's the best. She wants to make sure that she doesn't settle though, so she asks you for your honest opinion in the taste of her future dishes. This also implies more specifically what Yukiko does at the inn, or had been made up to do growing up. It's clear that she was given some sort of vice managerial role, maybe picking up errands or doing sweeps, double checking around the inn. I know that the Persona 4 animes actually do show her doing several general service and cleaning works things, but since the Persona 4 animes blatantly contradict the events of the games at times, changing the individual scenes to fit different character interactions, and also blatantly flanderizing and leaning into fan service where they previously didn't exist in the games, it's impossible to include them without using a very biased lens to cherry pick what does and doesn't count, so I'll leave that to you. For the sake of being consistent and accurate, I'm going to leave out any information from the animes in this analysis. I'm concerned with the game Persona 4 and Persona 4 Golden, written by Yuichiro Tanaka, Akira Kawasaki, and of course, written and directed by Katsura Hashino. If you want greater context as to the way that I deal with all spin-off material on an individual basis, I actually go into that in detail on my Lineage of Persona 4 video, so please check that out if you want further explanation. It's also likely, as a host, that some of the tea servicing or spare work was also pushed on Yukiko working at the inn. The point really is that more vital, difficult things like cooking were seen as something she didn't have to focus on, giving a more lax view of her time in the inn subtly. Social Link 3 involves one of those optional events with Nanako I mentioned in the Chie segment, where depending on what you do with this link, Nanako will either show up or not for story purposes, slightly changing the content of the link. This link basically comes down to Yukiko's first try making food being awful and letting her know that you're still willing to see her get better and try her food, she mentions only having about a year left, which goes to emphasize to her and to you about the length she still needs to strive to achieve this personal competence in daily living. Oh, by the way, this next rank, this scene right here at the tables, this is the only time in the game that you see this. Interestingly enough, the closest thing you get to seeing this link is in Naoki's rank 8 at the set of table and chairs behind Yukiko, meaning there are two entirely separate yet extremely similar scenes only used once in Persona 4. For someone like me who has literally been gouging my eyes out over footage for over two months at the point of writing this essay and for a little over three months as of the time of recording this audio, 
Stuff like this is so infinitely interesting to me. The production history and all that. If they were previously more planned, or if it was done early and went unused, so they just decided to throw it in as to not waste it. Since it has a unique, prominent ice cream cone in the scene, I wonder if getting ice cream was something planned for the upper ranks or something, similar to the omikuji at the shrine. It's weird because detailed writing is on the transcription, despite it being out of sight pretty much every time you come to Juness, mainly due to the huge billboard sign blocking it. A at least aside from that small group study date in October. Crazy stuff. The main sign says soft cream, by the way. The small ones on the back are a bit difficult for me to make out, even in 1080p. I can make out individual characters, but yeah, back to the topic. This social link comes back to her wanting to start studying with a proper job license. She's going overboard with seemingly childish view of what she needs though, buying everything she can think might be nice, including a specific desk. I think that this is meant to lend an idea of earnestness and worldly ignorance to her idea of being on the outside world and how to prepare for it, liking it to classic school studying rather than anything else. She also mentions getting a nighttime job from the work offer billboard that you showed her as well, which, as another bit of trivia, you can actually whittle down into which one she got. She mentions it's at night, so daycare worker is out. Translator can be done at any time at your house, and origami folder also doesn't pay. Within the social link at the hospital, you are always referred to as THE new part-time worker, which might sound like something that they just forgot to throw in, but this game will subtly change dialogue for everything going on. If Yukiko's link and this were meant to be connected at all, there would be at least a throwaway line mentioning a new girl working part-time there. Tutor is out because you literally take that job and Shu is one child, and so the only job that pays money, is available at night, and doesn't cross with another social link that the player canonically has, is the pub dishwasher at the Shiroko pub at night. This also makes sense with Yukiko's character though. She took a job where she collects dishes and deals with probably light customer service if she even has to do that. The dishes she's washing aren't gross food dishes either, but customer glass. Like if she was a dishwasher at say Aya instead, it would be a lot different. This is actually an addition in Persona 4 Golden. The Shiroku pub is the worst job that actually pays set wage in Persona 4, but also is the only job to up any of the player's stats depending on the customer they interact with. So this job is the best for a player trying to become a well-rounded person or up specific stats consistently. This makes the implied job a really good fit for what Yukiko is trying to do as well, becoming a well-rounded competent person before graduation. If this seems like an extreme stretch, hey, welcome. I imagine you haven't already seen the deep dives of proof for other interestingly small details in Persona 4. So if you want more details, I have other videos, but for a brief rundown, like Yosuke implying to be hitting on Kashiwagi a month before she's introduced into the game, or Naoki's cream puff conversation from late in his social link being in the first free moment of dialogue in the game. There's, of course, all the effort they put into mythology through this game, so it honestly makes perfect sense from what I've seen. Anyway, the next part is where her plotline starts properly setting off. Some men arrive who Yukiko is familiar with, but she hasn't mentioned before. Turns out that they're from some shady broadcast station looking to capitalize on the murders by making the Amagi Inn into some creepy special place that Yamano was murdered at. Long-standing reputation be damned. When they insult Inaba as the dumps and having nothing to do, she politely begs to differ. This is something to mention again that Yukiko never badmouths her mother or Inaba in general. Still, after they leave, she mentions that maybe they should accept that, because the ruining of the reputation of the inn really would lead to them closing it in her eyes, and then she wouldn't have to feel shackled by this responsibility. But she follows it up with saying that she's taking her own life into her own hands and making her own choices. This is an important follow-up because this can be seen as her addressing her regression, accepting it as serious feelings, but choosing to take her own positive action rather than wishing for good or bad things to liberate her from the weight of her taking her own action, like is her primary struggle. The wish for the inn to fail is a weakness, a version of events where she doesn't take any initiative, but life just happens to go where she wants, just like the Prince Charming situation. 
She sees this thought, admits that it's a valid feeling, and moves on to a mature solution. Once again, we get brought back to the food gathering for her cooking practice in Link 6, although this time the focus is more on her in's reaction to her trying to learn to cook. Yukiko is surprised to learn that the people who work at the inn, even at her behest, refuse to stop helping her in her personal decisions, offering advice and caring for her, even though it's not even related to their job. They embrace the new thing Yukiko wants to do. This is the start of Yukiko's realization that we'll see more going forward. Another birdcage she didn't realize was already open. Even the workers, their family. Since she didn't mention wanting to leave, it became about a boy who she was cooking for and everyone wanted to make sure that she did the best that she could. She mentions her parents getting involved from there as well, trying to help, not shutting her down or making her do work elsewhere, but giving her an entire room to grow where she said she wanted. The next part is the first time directly shown to the player that Yukiko likes you, although the confession link is still ahead. Next are the shrine social links, my personal favorite in Yukiko's link, with the rank starting with how much she likes coming to the shrine to pay respects and how she comes here with the waitresses at the inn as well. She's always done it since she was little and felt comforted by the shrine, in times before big guests and so on. This shrine and Yukiko are actually connected metatextually as well. The town of Inaba is based off of Fuefuki City, previously Isawa Town in Yamanashi Prefecture, with many personal Japanese blogs posting photos of their pictures. The shrine in Inaba is based off of a shrine you can find there that branches off from the shopping district as seen in the game that exists in real life, and actually has a sign explaining the history and backstory for the shrine. This actually depicts Guess who? Konohana Sakuya, which is Yukiko's persona. An extremely esoteric detail that I thought that I would share with you, maybe for the first time on the English-speaking side of the internet. If you're not getting this, the shrine in Inaba is a real-life place that it's based off of, and that real-life place happens to be dedicated to the persona that Yukiko has. Yukiko starts rambling about all the significant things that she's done with her family, school, and thinks to herself, once she leaves this shrine that she actually considered as a part of her, which as we see in real life honors her, or rather the persona who represents her, once she leaves, she won't be able to simply come back again, will she? We see her finally faltering in a commitment to leave in general, as a worker at the inn comes up to her and decides to tease her, supportedly asking if this is the boy that she's heard so much about, praising that all of her hard work must be paying off. After she leaves, this reasserts the supportiveness of everybody at the inn, adding new information like the fact that the workers actively choose to use their break time to help her cook, and that everyone is excitedly celebrating the first time that she didn't mess up entirely. Yukiko ruminates on how she feels so happy to be supported like that, mentioning that she's also grown to have all these friends, and how she really feels very lucky and wants to do the best for everyone. This, of course, adds to later, with this seemingly coming into contradiction of sorts with her declared statement at the start of the link. Next link has a lot happen. First, the supportiveness is pushed in like three times as Yukiko mentions how the staff all want you to come by the inn and meet them. Next, the deputy mayor mentions a lot of people at the inn, and finally Kasai sets this social link into full motion. The people wanting to make the show tricked the inn and were now looking for her as their slam piece. This is really Yukiko's shining moment for me. After taking the harassment and trying to defuse things politely as she always has, we think back to her comment about wanting them to maybe cover the inn and ruin it after all, a few links prior. Here, she has the opportunity if she stays in her cage. She has the opportunity to let life run its course. She has the opportunity to get the thing she claimed that she wanted. Instead, Yukiko finally lets them have it. When met with a threat of defaming the inn, she quickly responds with a threat to their sponsors, sending them off for good. This represents the action made on the declaration. The declaration that was never about the said goal, but was actually about the fact that she intended to make actions for herself. She begun working on goals tangentially related to her declaration, but no progress had actually been made on the goal itself. In a way, this allowed Yukiko to feel free pursuing herself without committing to a long-term decision. Along the way, the surprising support caused her to realize that maybe she misunderstood the people around her all along. So here, not tangentially, but entirely, she acts in a way toward an immediate goal by her own loud expression. 
She leaves the cage for seemingly the first time for what she deems the correct action, without letting her feelings continue to be shut down. The next link is where Yukiko affirms to you that she's not going to leave Inaba along with her romance opportunity. This is a point where a lot of people criticize and mischaracterize her as going back on her goal. But hopefully after laying everything out, painstakingly so, from all the reinforced Social Link's details, it's obvious that with even half of an attention span or general reading comprehension, that her social link was never about what decision she was going to make, but the fact that she truly felt confident enough in herself to make a decision and carry through with it. This is actually something repeated with many other social links, but for some reason I never see them hit the same criticism, even though they are also addressing the same theme. Like Rise quitting show business but deciding to go back. When Yukiko finally decided to outstretch her wings, she found that all the people surrounding her were abundantly supportive of her new ventures, whether it be cooking, showing interest in a boy, or working part-time. Yukiko felt from her high expectations and strict regimen that her opinion and her life were no consolation to her, not something that she had control over. This social link showed her crush those doubts and grow into a confident, direction-forward person who does what she wants for her own reasons, rather than the perceived will of others. I've decided not to leave Inaba. I never really objected to being the inn's manager per se. I just didn't like the fact that it wasn't up to me. I felt that my life was on rails. And I thought running away was the only choice for me. But no longer. I want to protect the family inn. After all, it's near to my heart. I wanted to become completely self-sufficient. But I think I was being presumptuous. I have the inn, I have my family, I have the waitresses and chefs. I am who I am now because I was raised by such a kind group. When I think of it that way, my problems aren't just my own. That's why I'm going to stay here. Here in rank 10, she awakens from Konohana Sakuya to Ematarasu. I already gave info on her ultimate persona elsewhere, but I want to note one more thing that I've seen people reference in covering Yukiko, but not always with this exact explanation. A famous story of Amaterasu, who rules the sun, was a time when she shut herself away. All the people's voices made her desire to re-enter the world. Yukiko did shut herself away, in the same way that we referred to with the cage and with Konohana Sakiya earlier. But this bit about the voices of others bringing her back now also makes full clarity with her current link. As after she realized the support of the wonderful people at the inn, as well as you and the rest of her friends around her, who she cites as making her start to realize this, she decided of her own power to return to the inn, to come back to the world. It's just a very fitting change on nearly any level of analysis, and little chef's kiss things like this litter nearly all of the mythology in Persona 4. Yukiko fittingly gives you a shrine charm to remember and protect you by. The charm technically would protect you from whichever goddess is honored there, which again leans into the real-life shrine paying honor to Yukiko's initial persona, Konohana Sakiya. Really makes this even more touching, I think. Coming back to Yukiko, at the end of the game, from her final persona upgrade, shows that she is dedicating herself further to the inn in ways that she had never personally even tried to opt in for, I think Yukiko spells herself out perfectly here, though, so I'm gonna let her talk about it. I told everyone at the inn that I hadn't planned to take over as manager, that I wanted to leave Inaba. I thought it would be me finally coming clean to everyone. But they all just laughed and said they knew already. It made me realize how small I was. I was surrounded by good people, but I didn't understand that at all. I had myself convinced I had to bear my problems alone. I lied to myself, and looked away from small opportunities, and only put my efforts into leaving it all behind. But after making so many good friends like you and Chie, I realized something. If I'm going to take one step at a time away from here, Every step I use to run will take me somewhere I don't want to be. And if I keep averting my eyes, one day I might find myself blind to everything. 
The upgrade, Sumeo Okami, is a descriptive term given to Imatadasu. I guess you could say, rather than a formal name, it's a phrase that describes the self. In Yukiko's case, Yukiko no longer represents an idea. She understands the meaning behind that which she represents, proudly and with strength. Yukiko Amagi is the High Priestess Arcana in Persona 4. One might immediately draw a sort of power similarity between the position of the priestess as the inn manager's daughter and the princess of her castle, but that is far away from where the comparisons stop. The Pillars. The High Priestess is depicted with a pillar on either side of her. The left pillar is negotiation, where someone makes a choice to stand firm and refuse proposition. The right is a pillar of affirmation, saying yes to a decision and moving forward with it. The Priestess is caught between the center of two responses, like Yukiko, unable to choose with her own directive which path she really wants, or make choices to make those a reality. The High Priestess then represents the feminine side of God, alongside the masculine side found within the Magician. Of course, within Persona 4, Yukiko and Yosuke, who is the Magician, have personas who are brother and sister, Amaterasu and Suzano. The creation of Amaterasu, a female god of the sun, and Suzano, a male god of the storms, are both gods who were born from the god Izanagi. They are literally pieces of him, with Amaterasu coming from his left eye and Suzano coming from his nose. On the High Priestess's head is the Crown of Assis, represented by a waning, full crescent-like moon. Like Thor's hammer, the only person with the power to lift Assis's crown is the High Priestess herself. This goes back to no one in the world being able to perfectly understand and act out the goals of Yukiko, aside from Yukiko, who chooses to take action herself. On the High Priestess's high polarity, it represents the reconciliation of opposite paths, the peace of finding her own path through reconciliation. On the lower polarity, it represents a self-doubt, an inability to deal with opposing feelings or perspectives, unable to find peace within herself. This lower polarity represents Yukiko as she begins her journey in this social link, and before her encounter with herself. The higher polarity is the momentum she achieves at the decision and carry-through of her link, as we saw. Now we're going to talk about a few things concerning Yukiko's character that I haven't already mentioned in her primary links or arcs or parts of her character. These are extra elements, character flaws, and quirks. So, let's get into it! For one thing, she has a terrifying laugh, although knowing Chie and Yukiko's backstory, this actually represents a very positive thing. The strained and restricted sense of humor for Yukiko that had been silenced at a young age, not likely literally, but from being told no, and being told to help work, both of which a few too many times. This caused an uncertainty and joylessness to grip Yukiko as she lived. Chie comments on her personal goal to bring joy to Yukiko from that moment of their childhood, and her amount of horrible laughter increases through the entire game around more and more people. It's really an emblem of her character growth as a whole, even from a point before you enter the story. Not just making decisions or growing out of her shell, but relearning to enjoy and love life, taking it into her own hands. An actual character flaw, though, that we see in the story stems from the sense of inaction that's core to her arc. If Yukiko were given the trolley problem, she would probably choose not to touch the lever out of the mentality that it was destined to happen. Her not stepping in doesn't make it her responsibility. And hey, maybe you agree with that, or maybe you agree with that idea but not for the same reason. Whatever it is, for Yukiko, this inaction causes her to incidentally contribute to sliding her friends multiple times. When Chie spends hundreds of dollars on Yosuke's account, sending him into brief debt and multiple days of unpaid work, she was present for the entire event, but she never stopped or encouraged the behavior. Chie and Teddy are generally not responsible people in the slightest, or people that understand and take things of others into a serious capacity. This isn't a slam, it's just accurate from everything we've seen that happens in the game. In theory, Yukiko then should have been the responsible party who reeled them in, but she chose instead not to act, which contributed to the harm of one of their friends. During the hot spring trip, where Yukiko makes a mistake on the scheduling times of the baths, she considers getting out so that the boys can have their rightful turn, especially after hitting them with wooden buckets as an apology. But when Rise suggests that they just pretend they never noticed, Yukiko lets Risei make that decision for her, and decides to do nothing. 
Even Yukiko's bad cooking comes down to Yukiko's non-committal attitude. During the omelet tasting, you note how strangely Yukiko's omelet managed to have so many ingredients and yet no flavor. Kanji agrees too. This is a more comical way of putting her inability to make decisions in meaningful ways which her whole character arc focuses on. Another aspect of her character is that Yukiko can't read social situations. She's totally unaware of romantic advances most of the time, unaware of different turns of phrase, and yet combined with that endearing trait is also a tendency toward violent overreaction. Whether this be pushing Kanji into the river at the camping trip, or how the camping trip implies that Yukiko beat him unconscious without thinking when he entered their tent. Something that most people seem to forget about since it's so subtle, and while people complain about Persona beating its players over the head, the players seem to miss it when they don't. There's also that time that Yukiko thought that Yosuke was making a sexual joke and slapped him when he actually wasn't and was actually just leading into a very wholesome, normal thing. On a contrary interpretation, Yukiko seems in some moments to be more aware than she's leading on as to how much she perceives, such as her knowledge of the King's game, and more so her sadistic behavior and threats sometimes, like when Kanji doesn't want to initially cross-dress because of the way it crosses into his understanding and security, and Yukiko pushes him into it by bringing up Kashiwagi and the attendance record, essentially blackmailing him into doing it, or how she laughs at or just finds humor in moments where other characters are mildly hurt in the story. Her schadenfreude is on clear display. This additional aspect of her, while showing its head fairly infrequently, does make someone really reassess who she is. If it was ignorant anger, or a joy to harm someone else with the social acceptability to do such a thing. I feel this aspect of her, while having a clear amount of evidence, is still left indeed ambiguous as to how much that mixture is her leading it on, and how much that is genuine ignorance. So all that we're left with really is we can assume that there is a level of awkward social aloofness and a level of sadistic manipulation to greater or lesser extents, on either end all throughout the game and her actions. These parts of her really only start happening though as the friend group and fun moments happen more and more as well. So this could be her way of experimenting with the feelings and actions she had, which had been also restricted over the course of her finding a guiding directive. So, in a way, these negative traits could actually be feeding into part of her subtly coming to grips with her new directive in life. Hopefully that gave you a lot of new back-to-back -back information to think about, but let's get back into the character arc. What is there to say about Yukiko that I haven't already exhausted from seven different directions? Probably a lot, actually. Like how if you revisit Yukiko's dungeon, you can get the Suzaku feather, Suzaku being a red phoenix-like bird, one that looks like her boss, funny enough, but also the symbolism of a phoenix burning and being reborn from the ashes fits nicely with Konohana Sakuya's hut. I could talk about the 160 cherry blossom trees that line the onsen street from Isawa Onsen, the real-life place of the Amagi Ryokan is based on, with many generational inns connected to that hot spring street in Fuefuki City. I think we've at least covered her, though, in a way that does not minimize her intricacy. Yukiko Amagi is a person through a likely strict upbringing due to constant business and work around the inn came to internalize the lack of time that she had to do such things as take in a dog. It's something that stifled her own spirit. Quietly, she suffered with some sense of relief from her only friend Chie as she tried to keep her head down the best that she could getting the best grades, keeping up satisfactory public appearances, but rarely getting close to another person, rarely taking opportunities to splurge in her interests, and as her unobtainability deified her among other schoolmates, she wished someone would obtain her, kidnap her, take her far away from this crushing responsibility and this public image. So consumed with the idea, she stopped reaching out or trying anything on her own, so that by the age her family and in-workers finally recognized her autonomy and considered her mature, she never even tried to do anything anymore, despite earning the trust of her family that she knew what she was doing. In an almost painfully Japanese style, neither side reached out to express their feelings honestly, but eventually, Yukiko faced this self-pitying, dreamy-eyed helplessness and looked up to the world again with her own directive.
When she looked up, she peeked out from behind the rock, like a Matarasu. She discovered the world was far more full of love and support than she remembered, and she became radiant as the sun goddess she represented, finally seeing and deciding to her own way and with her own decisions to protect the inn and the people who carried and loved her. She stopped burdening herself with the flow of the wind and stood up to it before deciding which direction best fit. Yukiko reached out to the truth like all of the others. For her, it was seeing through the lie of confinement that she had given up inside. The greatest limit on our potentials is our will to try. And that was the cage that Yukiko didn't break from, but simply chose to open the door and leave. The lesson is not to buy wholesale even the things we tell ourselves about the world, because we are not the world. We don't know for sure that they aren't a lie, too. One must closely reanalyze and look at our own thoughts that limit our decisiveness, and think clearly on an individual basis which pillar we choose to pass. Certainly, someone else can't decide for us. Thank you for watching this truck full of Yukiko analysis. This is, as you probably know, one part in an ongoing huge series analyzing every aspect of Persona 4 Golden. If you want to continue seeing this project and fund me to make other big projects like this in the future, please support me on Patreon. There's plenty of links, pictures, background materials there. Also, like, comment, and share the video. It helps a truckload in getting those videos promoted. Anyways, I have been recording the raw audio of this for an hour and four minutes, so I'm finally going to lay down and try not to rip my vocal cords out. Hope to see you soon, and take care of yourself.